some services are more predicated by processes, experiential, but some are more like products. They're more packaged and standardised. So they're a bit of both. So talking about products, what we haven't spoken about very much, other than in the context of business to business versus business to consumer, is this incremental versus radical. Yeah? It's a very important distinction. But it's not a distinction in terms of value. We're not saying incremental is for dumb people. Yeah? It's for operations management people and stuff like that and suppliers. We do radical stuff. You know, we're clever people. You know, radical product innovation. That's not, that's not the distinction. The distinction is they're different. They need to be managed differently. And they have different contributions. So if you look in many sectors and industries, the game is actually incremental innovation, but cumulatively over time. It, I think it's, well, I say I think, I know it was Einstein who said one of the things he didn't really understand wasn't about physics, yeah? it was about how cumulative interest rates make such a big difference over time. Cumulative interest rates. Same thing here, cumulative incremental improvements go back to this idea of sustainable competitive advantage. Over time, if you're smart, you get better and better at certain things, and it's really hard to imitate that. It's not just about bigger plant, better plant, or better process. It's about understanding deeply how the product and the process are interacting, what works, what doesn't. Okay? Trial and error, experimentation, call it what you will. So sometimes the trick is that cumulative incremental innovation over time, and that's really smart. Other cases, that's not smart. It's dumb. And I'll give you an example again. Toyota. Toyota is probably the mix my metaphors here, godfather, I guess that should be Fiat, shouldn't it? It's the godfather of Kaizen, or Toyota production system, including the title, yeah? Or whatever, yeah, different permutations on that. And a lot of the good stuff we know about quality management and process improvement comes from particularly Toyota, not so much the other ones, okay? But even Toyota realised it had a crisis about a decade ago and said, this is no good. Nobody's paying a premium anymore for quality, okay? And they... They didn't use PIMS, but the same principle. We've reached a point in quality, relative C quality, where we no longer can charge a premium. Mm. Yeah? Apart from Fiat and a few French co companies, they're all pretty reliable, at least on the you know, two or three year ownership cycle. So people aren't willing to pay a premium in this segment. So what else can we do? So even in those sectors, they realized they had to do something different. And so they had different people managing different things to look at the whole product portfolio. One of the outcomes, unfortunately, um, were hybrid cars very high margin. Another outcome, which we'll talk about very, very, very shortly, is the Lexus. Okay? So you can have these, these different strategies at different times. Okay? Going back to that PIMS diagram. So, incremental can be good, particularly cumulatively. Okay? But sometimes you need to have, maybe have a step change and then go back that path. Process on the other side, whether it be a diamond or a circle, we've spoken about at some detail. But don't forget, the returns tend to be much higher for all the reasons that we rehearsed earlier. Hard to imitate, yeah? Hard to develop, hard even to observe when you benchmark. It's much easier to benchmark products and performance than it is processes because you don't get access. Or if you get access, they take you to one part of the building, yeah? Which isn't very interesting. When we were doing benchmarking in the car industry, we went into Fiat, they took us to this part and we were on a tram. It's like Disney. They were in this little tram car and they say, look at this. This is the most automated line in Europe. It's 26% of the steps were automated. It was fantastic. Yeah, things swinging around down the south there. Thinking, the Japanese don't stand a chance. Don't they know they've got better technology at Fiat? And you drive around the tram, drive the tram, lovely lunch, two and a half hours later. Can we actually walk around the plant? Not allowed. <laughs> but we have to. That's the methodology. We were sponsored by MIT in the States. That's the methodology. We have to spend five days here. We've gone on a tram ride. It's not Disney. We have to do it, otherwise you're not going to be in the database. And then people ask questions. So big calls to head office, blah, blah. As long as you have a chaperone. So they're taking us through the buildings and buildings, buildings, buildings. And there's this huge building. I do not exaggerate. The biggest building on the site. What do you think it was? Not a canteen. That was pretty big. Very nice. It's a rework area. <laughs> and it was downstream from the robotized line. Because it was a disaster. Yeah. And so they had massive manual rework area. It's just a crazy, crazy, crazy idea. OK, so. Um, but these are more, in, not more interesting. These are less intuitive. The vertical axis, whatever it is, a box, a diamond, call it what you are. But they think, if you like, a vocabulary of thinking about these. Now, position, I think, is sort of 
understandable intuitive. We've spoken about some examples about entering new markets with existing products and technologies and such like. And there are many, many great examples. Um, I guess you could argue that the Nintendo example is that they extended gaming to non-gamers and quadrupled the market by thinking, well, why is it you know, just teenagers and, and, and sad 20-year-old men doing this thing? Why is it? There must be a bigger market. And it's part of the interface, part of the nature of the games, et cetera, et cetera. And so now they've got you know, dancing princesses, not that I'm caricaturing this at all, um, and a more intuitive interface and cheaper machines. Yeah? And that worked for many, many years. Now they have another problem, but that's a whole other case study. Okay? So that's the positioning. Another one for those who are old enough, um, LucasAid. When I was a kid, you had LucasAid if you were very old and infirm, yeah? or you were very young like me and you just had measles. Yeah? I'm not contagious, I checked. Okay? And you're very ill and you need lots of sugar quickly. I'm not sure it's great for your diabetes, but that's another issue. We'll find out shortly. Um, but basically, it's a horrible, again, um, usual legal qualification supply. Um, it's a glucose based drink, yeah? And it had a very s relatively small market in terms of invalids, young and old. And then somebody sits back and says, well, let's reposition it in terms of an energy drink. Although the people you see drinking it don't look very energetic sometimes. But as an energy drink, a sports drink, could get lots of promotion and such like that. It's been a huge success. Many have followed subsequently, yeah? Um, so you know, positioning is often thinking about, about what, what does it actually, what can it do in other contexts? Sometimes it is just that. You don't actually change the focal innovation. Sometimes you have to adapt it. You know, sometimes you don't even have to adapt it. Okay, so go back to what we said earlier. A lot of the trick is searching what's around and adapting it. And that's a different trick to generate and do an R&D, which is important. But figuring out what other people, what other companies, countries, sectors are doing is an active thing to do. It's actively searching, saying, well, what could we do about that? How would we apply it in our market? How, what do our customers do with that? Okay. And then we move up, and this is where it gets slightly less satisfactory. You know, we're trying to emulate our peers in marketing and have lots of alliteration so we can all remember it. And marketing, I think one of our professors had 14 or 15 Ps at one point. It starts to get diminishing returns. You can't remember them all. Um, so we're trying to get a P for things that we hadn't captured. And I, don't, I hate the word paradigm, but I couldn't think of anything else. If you do, let us know, and we'll appropriate it. Um, paradigm, mental model, business model, call it what you will. Okay, so it's not just about positioning. It's not only about process or product. It's something in addition to all that stuff. Okay, so I guess one example might be, although you might argue it's more about positioning, low-cost airlines. Low-cost airlines, at least the pure ones like Southwest and Ryan, not the ones who've gone all soft like EasyJet where you get seats and things like that. Uh, but the pure model, I think, actually generated in a sort of blue ocean sense, new consumers who had different criteria of what quality was and what value was and what was important. So it generated additional demand, yeah? Okay? Um, and again, I don't care about the language. It's really trying to go beyond it's all about products and it's all about radical products, and that requires lots of technology and engineers, and so opening that up and saying, no, it's also about process. And it's also about incremental sometimes. And it's also about imitation and repositioning. And sometimes it's even about business model innovation, about how we create value from that, turn it on its head. Things like Spotify.